Right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this year's uh, conference. Um, just, just make sure we've got that. Yes, OK, good. so good morning. Um, as you become um, used to, we've got a fairly fast-paced morning for you. Not least, I've got around 44, 45 slides in about 50 minutes. So um, we're going to hit the ground running with a lot of this stuff. You've got slides in the pack. We have updated it with some of the latest data, not least um, the information that came out on Friday from the USDA, and of course, um, yesterday's um, first look at the UK supply and demand numbers as well. So you'll see those coming through. Presentations will, of course, be on the, on the website, and indeed, so will videos from today as well. Um, so you've got a lot of information to take away with you. There's a lot to cover. Um, and I think certainly in the seven years that I've been doing this is probably most of the most challenging year I've had to pull together an outlook. It's very easy to get sucked in just to the, to the low price mentality, but there's a lot of things we need to bear in mind. Um, here we go. And so, by terms of an overview, um, this is what I want to start. I'm going to start really some scene setting, really to get you in the analytical mood, um, and then we're going to move into, into the sort of the, the meat of the issue and get into some global commodity market analysis through wheat, into maize, and into barley. And then I'm going to bring it back into the UK situation. Of course, we need to appreciate the global point of view from the price, get, get the context of the price direction, but it, what it matters is bringing it back. What does it mean? all for the UK and we'll wrap it all up with some sort of big picture um, conclusions at the end. You will find littered through the presentation are some quite wordy summary conclusion slides. I won't be reading them out for you. Um, you've got those to take away and digest in your own time. So let's start by setting the scene and as the chairman alluded to, um, we've, we've seen some pretty um, big crops in recent years. So the graph here is looking at world wheat and coarse grain uh, production and demand from the FAO. So the production is in the green bars there. And you see another big year, not a record year. And I think it's the important thing to point out. And we'll get into the details behind that a little bit later. But no doubt a strong year and a third consecutive year of global surplus. You may be forgiven for thinking that that black line, the growth in that demand line is actually slowing. Yes, year on year, that is slow growth of just 1.25%, down from the average over that period of 2.4%. But remember, it comes after some very strong growth we saw year on year last year at over 3%. So I don't think it's anything to get too concerned about, in my opinion, at this point in time. The impact of all this on prices, the chart here is looking at um, UK crop prices um, from DEFRA on the DEFRA index. Um, and, and you can really see the impact of the price, those fundamentals on the price in the last few years, and really illustrating that really we are operating in a commodity cycle. The, the impact on our oil margins is going to be quite marked, and we can illustrate this by bringing in really the indices of key inputs of fertilizer and crop protection. To an extent, that may well have been shielded um, by um, higher than expected yields, but nonetheless, margins are going to feel um, the squeeze, and really this part of the commodity cycle is a signal to, for arable businesses to start initiating their low price strategies. We are part of a, low, a, a commodity cycle. Low prices should not come as a surprise um, when they um, arrive. Key thing to bear in mind with a commodity cycle from a grains point of view it is very much driven by production, changes in production rather than demand, but you can't help but think about the big picture, what's going to happen by 2050. Um, with this in mind, I've tasked one of our analysts, a um, new analyst, Isabel Robinson, who's with us today, to go away and think about and look how 2050 might look in terms of the yields required. The first step of that analysis was to really consider the current trend in per capita consumption, in this case of wheat and maize. And you can see really that the maize, in terms of per capita consumption, has shown the most growth, primarily driven by biofuel demand, but also by the growing desire for animal products as the world becomes more westernized. The next objective here was to put some trends, some suggested trends through to 2050, some fairly broad brush things, and we've come forward with three trends here. Trend A is an unchanged situation from the, from the current as we see it, um, right through to C, which is a continuation of the 1960 to 2015 trend, and B is just a broad brush midpoint between um, the two. Next stage to that, how does that look in comparison? We'll run, run that up with uh, population stats and projections for 2050. This is quite enlightening when I looked at this because it's not necessarily a case of just using 9 billion people. There's a huge range um, around that, and there's some, that gives us some demand scenarios. And the final bit of the analysis is really to look at what that means 
for potential crop yields come 2050. And um, what we've done here is take those demand scenarios and divide it by the current areas, and that gives us a very broad brush uh, range of kind of yields that would be required to meet that demand in 2050. I think the conclusion is that yes, yields will need to grow. I think how much those yields will need to grow is up for some debate, and really only time will tell over um, that period. We've made the big assumption that there's no changes in crop area over this time, which I think is a sensible assumption for wheat. We know that the global wheat area is relatively static, around 220 million hectares, some way below the record of 240 we saw in the mid-80s. Maize is slightly different. We know we've seen recent growth in maize area. The record area was in 2014 of around 180 million tons, a million hectares, sorry. And so growth in the maize area would dilute the need to get growth um, in, the, in, in, in the yield. So there are lots of nuances around this kind of analysis. Yes, we'll probably need to see yield growth, but I don't think we can go out and hang our hat on and say by 2050 the world's going to be a bottomless pit of demand for grain commodities. Essentially, the key message here is competitiveness is going to be really, really key. That brings us to the end of sort of what I would call the scene setting area. I'd like to very much get into um, the context of the commodity specific outlook right now and, and get involved into what's happening um, on wheat. Now, a year ago, uh, wheat um, was a very interesting market. We had uh, at a global level of some um, real polarizing forces in the wheat market that gave us a huge breadth of prices. Um, from the low-grade export prices right up to, say, Canadian um, high-protein wheat. It's a very broad shop of, of prices. This year, prices have consolidated in, and it's much easier to generalise about what's happening in the global sense of um, the wheat market. And we'll do that. We'll bring you some headlines, and then there's some uh, specific bits of detail that I think are really useful for you to um, have, a, have, have some awareness of. So let's start in terms of global production. Again, mimicking what we've seen at the total grain level, um, another big year of global um, wheat production, a record year, a big crop that kept getting bigger. Um, I think the edge has probably got to the limit of where it is now. I, don't, I can't foresee the wheat crop getting all that much bigger in, in the latest um, forecasts. In line with that, demand has crept higher um, as well, and I wouldn't be surprised if going forward we see more demand coming into the wheat market, capturing a little bit of um, feed demand uh, depending on price competitiveness. Nonetheless, I still expect uh, the world to turn a surplus of wheat for the third time um, in a row um, this season, and the impact on stocks to use for ratios is quite marked. You can see now that the forecast of wheat stocks to use for ratios is expected to stabilise above um, 30 per cent. So you know, the, in general terms, there's a global abundance of wheat. The impact on prices has been quite clear. The chart here looking at um, key export prices from around the world, you can see how all of those prices have consolidated into one another. and um, that's had an impact on domestic milling premiums as well. Last year was about some very big domestic milling premiums, better quality domestically this year, and this global dynamic has really put the pressure on those elements um, as well. Just a quick um, trip around the world um, to really get you in, uh, in, into the spirit of where, we, where we're going. We'll, we'll have a look around, a fair bit of commentary coming um, on, on where we're going. Let's start with some key exporters. The EU, another big year, slightly down on last year. We'll get into the detail of the EU um, shortly. Um, the EU will be expected to be the world's largest wheat exporter again this season after um, taking that top spot um, last year. And with that comes some quite big responsibility, and I think it's really important that the marketplace decision makers bear that in mind. The EU has a huge responsibility in the role of global food security in terms of the supply of wheat to the global um, market. The next element, we, we take a look at what's happening in Canada. Um, and Canada was really the place you, you, you had to go if you wanted to find it much in the way of bullish news on, on, on wheat. However, that's been dwarfed by what's been going in broader North America and, and, and around the world. And so Canada alone wasn't really going to change the wheat market. Russia and Ukraine, not, um, not dissimilar to year on year in terms of production levels, very much becoming um, the importer's friend in terms of both price but also quality as well. It's important that we don't get complacent towards, under, towards looking at Ukraine and Russia as having competitiveness on price alone. It's the quality that does the, does the talking as well, and that's a key thing for, for establishing the competitiveness of Western European wheat in those in key import markets as well. That brings us to the US. Um, 
the US is going to be a victim of currency when it comes to wheat this year, um, accumulation of, of, of stocks, and it's really the hard red winter element there where the stock accumulation, I would expect to see hard red spring, will, will benefit from lower availability, to my mind, of um, Canadian wheat, but really hard red winter is the sort of the problem child for the US wheat market, in my opinion, and it's going to be, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see um, US wheat S stock estimates creeping higher as we go forward. Um, the two big players in terms of production, but not necessarily in global trade, we have to consider India and China. India is turning into a real fascinating area. It's escaping the headlines, and I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on that um, on, on the next slide. China, I think we have to refer to as a sleeping giant. Yes, there's an uptick in its demand expected in terms of import demand, um, but you know it's still only the t ranked 21st um, in the world importers. It's not going to recreate, I don't think, what we saw in 13, 14 when it became the world's fifth largest importer. And this is a lesson, we need to learn a lesson about China when it comes to wheat and barley, in that China's involvement in the, um, in the import market is going to oscillate in and out. It's not going to be a consistent um, player in that import market, so we can't view it as a bottomless pit um, of demand. It's really important that there's strategic things in place to allow sh those opportunities to be capitalised on, and we'll talk more about that when we get to, um, get to Bali. Um, just really then to complete the picture and talk about what's happening in, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, what I would call the Southern Hemisphere top-up. Less um, important this year because of the sheer amount of supply that's available out of the Northern, uh, Northern Hemisphere. I'm going to touch on uh, um, Australia shortly, um, but just for Argentina, the expectation is for a lower Argentine crop um, this year, and that's quite important. We need to consider the broader South American context, a challenging harvest at the moment um, for the Brazilian wheat crop, potentially some quality issues, and there's an indication that already Brazil will be buying more import Ports of, 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 of wheat up to a, an extra million tonnes on what we saw last year. Again, maybe not up to the levels we saw in 13, 14, um, which made it a big player. But if Brazil can't secure all of that supply from Argentina, it may well start to dip into some of those um, um, available US um, wheat stocks. So we might see um, some interesting developments going forward then. So that's sort of the, the sort of the headline production um, whistle stop tour. The next thing is to consider really what I think are the key benchmark indicators of where the wheat market is, considering how the, the stock profiles look around the world. And really for the big three um, producer exporters around the world of the US, the EU and former Soviet Union, all three of those have to take their share of stock accumulation, the US not least because of the currency and general uncompetitiveness issues, but even for the EU with weak currency um, and good exports um, seen in recent years will have to take its share of accumulated stocks as will um, the former Soviet Union, partly driven by the intervention system, intervention buying seeing in Russia. That counteracts what's seen in Canada, really we're taking the stock levels out of Canada um, off of the peaks that were seen off the back of a big 2013 um, crop. Um, I think a, bit, a tip really is just to watch India, just, just, keep, just keep a focus on it, it's slipping under the radar. Uh, sort of four or five years ago, the, the concept of India was raising minimum support prices, um, growing domestic production, um, swelling stocks and the prospect that India was actually going to have to start exporting wheat. All of a sudden, over the last few years, those stocks have started trending lower and lower and lower. It's come to a bit of a head. This year, um, untimely rain for the crop in the northwest of the country has hit quality and you start to see India picking up some import demand, principally from from um, Australia helping to really meet quality needs. I think there's a broader commodity issue facing um, India going forward. Notably, I think sugar is a one to, one to watch. There's your free tip at a grain conference, watch sugar. Um, it's all interlinked. Um, monsoon rains have been the driest in six years for India, and so it's just um, could have some broader implications on commodity production. Um, um, within there. Um, given the low global prices, it's very likely that India will try and import its way out of this problem, only becomes a headline issue if global prices start to rise and have bigger implications. So as it stands at the moment, not a headline issue, one to watch as well. If it becomes an issue for um, wheat, it could be in 2016. Reservoir levels are quite low, haven't been replenished, and so depending on how things stand for the 2016 crop, there could be some issues um, there, but there's a long way to go. Um, I'll just complete the picture by putting the current trends for the Southern Hemisphere producer exporters. 
We can't get too overly excited about those because we need to wait until we see um, those harvests, those qualities, and the competitiveness of those exports coming forward. Um, just want to leap into some specific stuff now um, and get and really focus on some key areas that I think are the priority areas for wheat around the world. The first one is touching on this very topical area of the Russian um, wheat tax, um, a, a mechanism put in place to protect Russian wheat prices from weakening currency. The chart here along the bottom is um, the, the value of the dollar um, against the ruble, essentially a weakening ruble or a strengthening and dollar, and the, the, the impact on the um, domestic Russian price in rubles up the side. This is based on a, a scenario of um, export wheat price of $180 per tonne, probably slightly lower where we, from where we are at today's levels. This is what happens in the free market situation. Currency weakens and, and internal prices um, go up. Um, and the concern, the Russian concern is that with all the economic issues happening in Russia, weak currency is going to drive up domestic prices. So to combat that, we've seen two waves of export tax from the 1st of July. The first mechanism was put in place to try and soften that blow um, of the export tax on the domestic price. Um, after a bit of lobbying from, from exporters, um, there's been, the export tax was revised, and this is the post 1st of October profile, and as you can see, with the, the, the dollar oscillating really between 60 and, and, and 65 um, rubles, this current export price, it's having a limited price impact. Um, I think there's a concern of the logistical in, impact that it could have. You know, we can define Russia as a no-nonsense exporter, and there's, a, there's a likely to be a need to hedge currency because the currency calculation is done as at the cargo passing customs rather than when the deal is done. So there's a bit of hedging needed to, to currency risk there. That brings cost, that brings complication, which can be a bit of an issue for, as I said, a no-nonsense exporter. The analysis here looks at the FOB price of £180 a tonne. The unintended consequence potentially is what happens if the global price rises and let's just add $50 a tonne onto the price or £30 a tonne onto the price and that's the implication you have. So at higher prices, higher world prices, you get a bigger implication from the Russian import tax. And I just want you to hold on to that thought for a few slides and we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Let's jump from Russia into Australia, another topical area um, going on at the moment. Um, and a lot of talk with El Nino, what's the impact of that? And I'm sorry if you're, if you're um, waiting on a, um, on, on a bullish run on the back of a decimated Australian crop. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, the chart here is looking at July to September rainfall. Generally, um, it was pretty average. September started to, um, to dry up, and that's fed over into October, and that started to raise some sort of fringe concerns. Okay, how is the Australian wheat crop going to look? Here's a bit of history of the Australian um, wheat production. The far right is the current government forecast for production. I wouldn't be surprised if we're talking um, later in the season about a year-on-year -year decline in Australian wheat crop rather than a year-on-year -year increase. However, I can't see it at the moment falling much below, if at all, below 20 million tonnes. Put it in an Australian context, it's unlikely, I think, to recreate what we saw in 2006 and 2007. You need to put it into the global context as well. The wheat market was very different in 2006, 2007. The world was much more reliant on Australian wheat to top up tighter supplies from the Northern Hemisphere. So Australia might lend some support to the market, make the market feel less bearish. I don't think it's going to revolutionise um, the market as we um, potentially have seen historically. Let's jump from Australia. Let's get into what's happening um, in Europe. Another, and the, the line here is looking at um, uh, European wheat production. Um, a big year, down year on year, huge French crop, and we're going to get into the specifics of the French supply and demand um, very shortly, offset by lower crops in Germany and Poland, um, although historically still um, quite high. Interesting um, that we should see some stronger demand coming from Spain and Italy, but there will be both fierce internal and external competition to meet that demand. And so um, it's very much a, a, a buyer's market within that. In, in the east for Romania and Bulgaria, slightly less availability, and so not really the useful, uh, unable to sort of tap into as much of that Egyptian demand as potentially we've been used to. We've been used to seeing a lot of Romanian business going into Egypt, um, uh, f for instance. Um, just really my key message on, on Europe is, about, is around exports on 
on wheat. The last four years, Europe has impressed forecasters, has basically beat the forecast, and forecasters have had to every so often increase their exports. And I think forecasters are becoming immune to that, and it's now assumed by the market that Europe will have good export pace. It's no longer lending sort of mid-season support um, to, to the price. So it's now assumed that Europe will have a good export program. The, as it stands at the moment, we're pretty much in line proportionately with the forecast, so around 20 percent, 21 percent of um, the total exports uh, forecast is represented in export licenses year on year. That's very much in line. But let's just touch quickly on the French supply and demand. Um, I never really got into specifics of this, but I thought this year it's very interesting, very useful to do so. You know, continued growth in the French wheat crop in recent years, over 40 million tonnes. Um, it's finding more demand, ironically, with better quality this year in the French wheat crop. Um, it's having to find more feed demand than it did last year, simply because there's a dynamic of what we're seeing in the broader grains complex in, in Europe. A much better quality crop, 1% um, of sample, only 1% of samples falling below that 76 kilo weight. Um, uh, specific weight, contrast that to a year ago where 41% of samples were falling below 76, causing real issues um, for the operation of the French market, French futures. However, bigger crop exports appear that they're going to be lower. It's a massively competitive export market out there and it becomes a bit of real headache for, for forecasters to know how to balance S&Ds this year with big crops and very competitive environments. The final chart here really looks to just balance that out. The blue, the, the um, yellow areas are, are the stocks, and that you've got a black blob on top of the 1516. That is essentially a mobile blob of two and a half million tons that has yet to be allocated specifically in any part of the French supply and demand. And it can go to any three of the, of the components of, of demand. I think we should expect for an element of that to head into stocks contributing to higher stock carryover in, in to, for Europe's biggest producer, um, exporter. Um, why do I say that? Well, you've got the carry in the French market. The graph here is looking at the forward prices, looking at the premiums of the forward prices over the, the spot price. And you've got premiums this year are similar to where they were um, 12 months ago. Um, the, you've got better quality this year, which is maybe a sweetener to encourage more material to be covered. We're going to cover this a little bit more when we get into the, the UK section. There are your global wheat conclusions. We're going to move rapidly into maize now, consider that. And maize is really um, is something that we can't ignore. Um, I think it's I think best described as a, as a semi-dormant volcano. We saw the volatility that maize can bring to global grain prices in 2012 as an extreme. And actually in 2013 and 2014, we saw the downward volatility that the maize price brought to the, to the market price. Place. Um, the graph here is just looking at key futures prices um, around the bottom line there is the maize price. The other three are key um, um, wheat futures markets important to um, the UK context. So 2013, 2014, step downs in maize prices. 2015 is actually providing stability in the global grain price, and we'll touch on why that is at the moment. Wheat, though, is screwing back onto that maize price quite evidently. You've got essentially a 13 percentage point differential between wheat stocks to use ratio and maize stocks to use ratio. Um, that's the highest it's been since 11-12. So wheat has to, is in relative abundance. It has to try and find some competitiveness to try and um, extract some demand away from maize. Let's just touch quickly on the global maize supply and demand. Uh, we touched on a billion tonnes of production. Phenomenal long-term growth we're seeing in global maize production. It's dwarfing every other crop. Um, and particularly it's dwarfing wheat as well. It's becoming more and more important to the global mix of prices. I keep banging on about that every year, um, but I don't think we can underestimate the importance of how maize is operating. It's down year on year, 5% in the US. Um, down, it's expected to be down 7% in Brazil and Argentina. Um, demand in line with that is down, um, shifting some demand already away from maize towards um, wheat in some instances. Um, and the impact of that, an 8 million tonne deficit for the global maize market, actually starts to sensitise um, global maize supply and demand back below 20%, around 19%, and actually longer term, it feels like there's a bit of risk that is potential that can emanate from the global maize market. So that, that's, a, as always, is a key thing to watch, and it sets us up very interestingly as we head into the South American growing season 
and through this year and into next year where we start to get back into northern hemisphere um, dynamics. What, one of the things that makes May such a risky commodity is the sheer um, lack of producer exporters. It's really dominated by US and Brazil and Ukraine to an extent. This chart here just shows the export share of that. And that's quite unique because at one wherever event in one of those countries can actually have quite big ramifications for the global price. On this chart, I'm interested actually the smallest part of it, um, I'm interested in that in that Russian bit and how that's emerging over the last few years and how that might impact in a minute. We're gonna stick that together with the um, wheat export tax. I'm gonna come up with a scenario of how things could pan out given the right set of circumstances. It's quite an interesting um, concept. But before we get there, I just want to put into context of how 1617 might look. We haven't even seen the 2015 harvest, so here I am projecting what things might look like in 2016-17 through various um, scenarios. The line there gives you the historical stocks to use ratios. The dots on there, I haven't got time to take through the detail of the, of the, of the methodology, but looking at how things vary against the annual trends gives us a number of scenarios. The key point of this is really just to... Uh, the message on this is not to get complacent on feed grain prices. There are scenarios where we can see continued tightening of maize prices, particularly because we don't have a strong price signal heading into producing grain for or maize for the 2016 harvest. Don't underestimate the importance of price signals when it comes to um, maize production. I think it's really important to, to keep that in mind. Let's get, to, let's get into Russia then, and let's give you a bit of context here of what's going on. Um, so the graph here gives you some historical context in the solid lines in terms of Russian wheat um, uh, production and, and exports and the broken lines are the, are the baseline projections going forward. I think the combination of things, if the ruble remains weak, if global grain prices rise, if the Russian wheat export tax remains in place, if those three elements come together, then you, what you're going to see is an, an an incentive for Russian wheat far grain farmers to move more acreage away from wheat and more towards maize. And that potentially elevates Russia's influence importance in the global um, market. It, you could argue it's a little bit of a long shot to line those three elements up in a row at the same time, but it's not impossible. And I think we just need to be um, alert to that as a factor. Staying in the Black Sea region, we've been very used to seeing Ukraine as a key producer exporter. Big crops in 2013, 2014, essentially landing um, a lot of feed grain supply on Europe's doorstep. 2015, there's now some consensus that the, the estimate of the crop is going to be somewhere below 25 million tonnes. The USDA estimate came off by 2 million tonnes um, on Friday. And again, what does it mean for 2016 as well? Again, where's the price signal um, for Ukrainian farmers? So that may well ease sort of the, the near-term pressure on European feed grains um, a little bit as we head, get through. We've got to get through the tail end of the 2014 crop first. The marketing season, remember, for maize is that little bit later because of the later harvest. And so there's a bit of pain to go through before we get into the true dynamics, I think, of, of the maize situation. Let's bring it into Europe. Europe is what I would define has had a very lucky escape in terms of maize this season um, from the Commission. This data comes from, so there are the opening stocks elevated because of last year's big production, and that stock could not have come at a more timely period to really bail out that dip in production, really making up for the heat and dryness that we saw through the end of June, early July, and the check that that's put on European maize production. Just to complete the picture on import, touched on Ukraine there a little bit as well. On the demand side, yes, it's growing, but it will feel competition from wheat. Exports don't really feature that much, but really look at look at how the, the stocks are having to have to, gonna, gonna contract come the end of the season, really to make up for that production shortfall. And so it's sort of another sensitizing item um, in, in the feed grain market. Just quickly, the last thing on maize is to talk about the uncertainty in China, a lot of policy uncertainty, but also a lot of uncertainty in the data. And we're getting a situation where the market is struggling to really fathom what's going on. Um, let's just illustrate this with um, stock estimates for maize in China from IGC USDA. The trends, of this, the trends are going in the same direction, which is important, but we're getting wider and wider disparity between views of actually how much corn is in, or maize is in, is in China. That's largely, I think, partly down to the structure of the industry, the fragmented part of the industry. Um, nice little shot here of maize being 
um, dried on the highway. Um, not quite sure if that fits in with assurance or, or not, um, but um, that's the structure of the as it stands at the moment. And the fact that the crop's being harvested on the cob and then thrashed later through the, through the winter period gives a real challenge for really putting um, robust numbers around supply. This becomes more important, particularly um, if we're dealing with a sensitizing in the background of a, of a May supply and demand. I just refer um, to um, what Sylvia Wren said two years ago at this conference about the need for more, um, more information, more transparent information on China becoming increasingly um, important to the functioning of, of the marketplace. There are your, the May's conclusions. I'm going to move swiftly into talk about barley now um, and really set the scene with uh, the, the global supply and demand. And we know barley's not going to break any records when it comes to supply and demand. Um, generally moving sideways at the moment in terms of production, yes, a little bit up on last year, potentially looking at a small, um, small surplus um, but we know that now supply and demand are moving generally in tandem, operating on a relatively thin stocks-to-use ratio. And I think we're feeling an element of that when we bring it back to the UK context as, as well. The makeup of barley is changing. It's becoming less reliant on the dominant force of feed grain demand. It's becoming less of a commodity feed grain, more of a niche or I'd call an alternative um, feed grain. It's really important to bear that in mind. And, of course, consolidation happening on the brewing side as well. You see the... Uh, the, the, the merger between AB InBev and Sab Miller, that merger basically puts 30% of global beer production in the hands of one company and just illustrates the level of consolidation that the, 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 the global market is going through um, right now. A quick round the houses view of what's happening on, on barley um, for sort of main northern hemisphere producers. It's a mixed picture. Yes, the Canadian crop is revised slightly higher from the number you've got in your packs, but it's not really groundbreaking. We know that the Canadian barley area is in long-term decline. Contrast that 7.6 million tonnes against really the 11 to 13 million tonnes that we were commonly seeing out of Canada in the 90s uh, through the 2000s, and you can see just how consolidated the thing has become. Um, high area really offset by lower yields and relatively high nitrogen levels as well, which is causing a bit of um, concern. Less availability or less production coming out of the EU and Russia is, is, as well. That gives us some actually reliance on some southern hemisphere top up. You've got the numbers there for Argentina and Australia. I wouldn't be surprised if the Argentina number creeps a little bit higher. Um, better conditions now for the growing crop. Probably from a longer term perspective, uh, presidential elections in 10 days' time may well shape the future of how the cropping mix looks in Argentina and what the impact of the uh, election outcome on how the government interacts with export policies and whatnot will be a key strategic thing um, longer term. Australia, uh, El Nino probably has a bigger impact on global barley availability than global wheat because you've got this relatively tighter situation in barley than you have for wheat. Um, really considering where, um, where we are. The expectation is that barley harvest in Australia will be around two weeks ahead of normal, um, indicating that yields may be compromised as, as, because of the recent dry weather. So as with wheat, I wouldn't be surprised if the year-on-year -year increase in barley production in Australia turns into a year-on-year -year decrease. So it's just one to watch. Um, again, but we have to bear in mind that barley has to follow the general trends of the grey market as well. It's, this will just decide how, at what level of premium or discount it, it moves with the marketplace. Um, Australia is important because it's been a key supplier to one of the relatively new importers of barley, which is China. Now, China year on year is expected to import less barley, but it's still historically quite high. And it's about this oscillating force of China dipping in and dipping out. And it's about having the strategic ability to plug in that demand um, when it's there. So it's, it really underpins the importance of the work that AHDB has been leading on in terms of achieving that protocol. It's important strategically as a big producer and exporter um, of, of barley. The other key importer is, of course, Saudi Arabia, been used to being at the forefront of imports. Um, there's always talk of how Saudi is going to revolutionize its feed industry to become more efficient and become less reliant on barley. We continue to wait to see evidence of that happening, and it's a key market in, in that mind. In the context of China, we need to bear in mind um, that China seeks alternative feed grains sometimes um, to, to circumnavigate the, 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 the maize price policy, the maize import policy, and that's been a driving force behind its imports of barley in recent years. But barley is not the only alternative feed grain. We have to consider 
sorghum in the mix as well, and you can just see the combined supplies of barley and sorghum over the last few years. And I've never had to look at sorghum before. It's an absolutely fascinating um, um, crop, but it, the way it's going to interact with barley is going to be really interesting over the next few years. The key producer and exporter of sorghum is indeed the US, and the dynamics of US sorghum production basically emanates from what we've seen in Kansas and Texas pre-2015, some um, continual drought, and really farms looking for more drought-tolerant crops. In comes sorghum. In Kansas, for instance, you've got the highest level of production since the 1990s, and so it's become a real, um, been a bit of a game changer in terms of providing um, that availability to provide direct competition with barley imports into um, China. Now we've seen El Nino trying to break that drought in those key southern um, producing states. Will that cause a swing back towards more wheat in those states? It possibly would do, so maybe, maybe we've seen the peak of sorghum production. There's your um, barley conclusions. I'm going to jump now quickly into the UK situation. And, and I'm going to start by talking about, talking about maize. For, for a long time, I've always talked about maize in the context of having indirect implications for the UK maize price. I think now is an opportune moment really to remind you that maize is now having a direct impact on the UK grain situation. Here are the seasonal maize imports into the UK, and perfectly understandable why we saw elevated levels of imports in 12, 13, 13, 14 to deal with the relatively low availability of domestically produced grains. It gets a little bit more complicated when you start to consider 14, 15. Yes, it's lower year on year, but it's still historically quite high. But why is it still there when there's such an abundance of wheat, when there's a wheat crop in excess of 16 million tonnes? And it really emphasises the competitiveness of maize, that abundance of maize that was in Europe and Ukraine from harvest 2014. And we're actually seeing a hangover it because we're not through the old crop maize season yet. We've, in, from a July-June marketing year, i.e. the beginning of our new crop year, we've still seen quite a lot of abundance of maize. In July and August this year, we've seen 316,000 tonnes of may, maize imports. That's the highest level in records back to 1992. So we kind of have to deal with this maize hangover before we can sort of um, get to sort of the fundamentals of how the 2015 <laughs> maize crop um, looks. That brings us in nicely to talk about the UK um, supply and demand um, data. This is the fresh data from the published early balance sheet yesterday. Let's start with wheat. Another sizable wheat crop in excess of 16 million tonnes. I think it's worth clarifying that, yes, we are talking uh, talk of record yields, but that is not delivering record production. The production record sits back in 2008 with a, uh, a, a 17 million tonne plus um, crop number. Essentially, what yield is having to do um, is having to compensate for the fact that there is reducing opportunity to grow wheat in the UK arable rotation because of black grass, because of second wheat economics, and that's an important part. So produ productivity plays an important part in, in making up for area shortfalls. You could argue that one fuels off of the other. So that gives us some pretty strong availability when you combine that big crop with those large carryover stocks. But from a demand point of view, in dis despite of that high availability, demand is actually expected to be lower um, year on year, um, better quality could well mean higher flower yields and also um, less demand from the ethanol sector as well, with one plant currently out of action. What does it all mean for the kind of the key balancing items of exports and, and stocks? Um, in kind of a similar vein to how the French balance sheets are run, um, you have a, for the current season, you have an operating stock requirement, and that black bar there really is a free stock that can either be used for exports um, or carryover stocks. Um, don't underestimate the size um, of that. The challenge is huge. Um, bear in mind also that in the July, in the July and August ex, um, export import data, we are actually a net importer of wheat into the UK, and so there is a huge challenge there to deal with that surplus. But the market provides an incentive to do things, and so the market doesn't have to fall over itself, doesn't have to kill itself to become export competitive at any price. It provides the carry. The carry is providing is the key to understanding a lot of what's happening in the marketplace in the UK. Um, essentially, it's new season prices at a premium to spot market, essentially incentivizing long-term storage um, of, of, of crop. And that gives us some direct linkage between new crop news and old crop prices. 
just to give you some, uh, some numbers around there, we've run some calculations of what a, a net carry margin looks like after finance at three different costs um, of borrowing. And one thing that's quite clear is the market is trying to incentivize people to fill stores at the front end of the season now rather than trying to wait until the end of the season. So the market from a very early point is, is creating that alternative incentive. Traditionally, we relied on intervention to provide this service, to provide this balancing element. Now it's very much down to the commercial marketplace to deal with this and take advantage of the strategic investments as a country we've made um, in, in storage. Just really to touch on why the other reason the carry is so important, you would be forgiven this autumn for thinking um, the price trends are very similar, a very strange sense of deja vu. Here is the spot futures price through last autumn, autumn 2014. Here is the 2015 price. The patterns are very, very similar indeed, and essentially the principles of the carry at work is impacting here. Essentially, you have a new crop weather issue. Is it really an issue? Well, it's new crop weather sentiment. Is it dry? Is it cold in the Black Sea? Nobody actually knows what the true impact of that's going to be until we get to probably April, maybe even May. Um, and, but it doesn't stop the market speculating, doesn't stop the new crop price rising. The new crop price rises, maintains the storage investment, um, storage incentive, and so it means that near-term demand, in order to, to achieve, to get supply to cover near-term demand, has to raise its game to coax grain out of store. Um, and that's the dynamic at play here. Essentially what it does, it divorces the spot price from the spot market supply and demand fundamentals. Um, so it's quite a strange dynamic this year, but it's fairly clear what's at play um, now. So don't be surprised if you've got heavy supply fundamentals in the, in, in the spot market, yet the price continues to rise if there's a, a level of um, sentiment behind what's happening with, with the new crop. Um, it's, a, it's a distinct linkage that we have to get used to. Just getting into the, um, more into the detail of where we are in terms of UK wheat, I want to start talking about quality. Um, I think the headline is that it's a much improved quality year. The, the chart here, we're going to focus a lot on, on bread wheat. That's where much of the story um, um, is. There's, there's a, also information on biscuit wheat that we haven't had time to cram into the presentation, I'm afraid, but there's a lot of information um, on, the, on the website available. Um, if we look at the sort of the group ones and twos, and here we're looking over the last three years for the ones and twos, how many, what percentage of the samples are meeting the full 13%, 76, 250, um, specification and year on year it's actually it's higher we'll jump onto the reasons behind that shortly um, I think what's important to bear in mind is contrasting this against the low grade pass rate think of the group one and two market as a pyramid and we've got basically two years now we've had a slug of sort of low grade um, low medium grade at the bottom and that's got broader and it's kind of creating a relatively narrow peak where the sample where that's the, the, the pass rate of, uh, of the full spec. And so when we come using this to interpret back to our good old friend, the milling premium, I think an important element of the milling premium is not necessarily between the feed base and the, and the, milling, and the, um, the milling wheat price. I think we, we need to have a little bit more interest in the price differential between full spec and low and medium grade prices because that's an important price signal for the farmer to deal with the impending variety shift that I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides time. A bit more detail on the quality aspect of things. So it's a better year. We've got 32% um, of samples achieving, or group one samples achieving um, the, uh, the, the full spec. That's an improvement. Um, the key element driving that was the protein pass rate up from a, a 16 to 38%. Um, it's still the limiting factor though, um, behind achieving those at full spec. And I think this is gonna fuel over the long term a debate over what the customer requirement is. Are we using protein content as a proxy for protein quality and its, um, and its functionality in the bakery? I can't help but feel we're using it as a proxy and there's potentially some efficiency gains to be had from having a, a broader discussion about how protein is measured. Protein, of course, is a very expensive thing for the farmer to build in the milling wheat crops. That's very important that the farmer receives the right market signal to go for the right grade that is indeed um, required by the end user. That brings us on nicely to talk about the UK, um, what I would say, the UK variety shift. Um, and I wouldn't normally um, in, be talking about specific varieties, um, 
I don't think you can make an analysis of the UK wheat market right now without making some specific variety comments. Um, it's not a one variety wonder, this market. Um, there are several varieties at play. And I think the big caveat with what I'm about to present to you is that I'm talking about this in very, very general terms. So taking it back to a, a local level, taking it back to an individual farm level, it needs to be tested against local agronomic and local market conditions. So over the last 10 years, the, vari the varieties have been split basically on yield. You've had the growth in group four, feed wheat yields um, and they've had a quite a significant premium of yield over the group ones and the group twos and that's encouraged more and more farmers to focus on group fours the barn felling varieties taking advantage of relatively high feed wheat prices and take what was perceived to be a relatively low risk um, approach so we need to bear that in mind now that yield gap is being challenged now by three varieties first we had skyfall coming onto the scene its first commercial harvest in 2015 Around the corner, approaching their first commercial harvest in 2016, is Trinity and Lily. So really, we've got a trilogy of varieties that are fueling the near-term um, variety shift coming forward. Before we get into sort of the broader dynamic, let's just focus on what it means to the traditional milling wheat um, producer. And we've used Crusoe really as an example of that on a standard milling wheat budget of £521 a tonne. And so we're looking at variable costs. We're not looking at full cost of production. If you want full cost of production, you need to at least double these numbers to get anywhere near, in my opinion. We're talking very, very general terms here. So you can see the yield advantages of um, Skyfall, Trinity, Lily over that standard milling wheat budget. Now you could argue that you would need to up inputs on those high yielding varieties to achieve a high, to, to meet the higher spec. Brings me back to the previous point of the market needs to be very, very clear on that signal of what it needs, otherwise it's going to be a challenge to, 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 to basically meet those elements. If you go along the lines of protein dilution through yield, probably a, it's, a, it's a very loose relationship um, in, in my opinion. So it's going to draw traditional milling wheat growers towards these high yielding, potentially lower risk um, varieties, not just in the ones and twos, but also in the threes as well. And so we may well find ourselves having another discussion um, about um, how much group three there is available and what that means um, for supply chains. The interesting element, the, 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 the thing that's busting wide open right now is not really about talking about milling wheat, it's talking about wheat in general. And, it, and I'm gonna focus really on now on growing things to a feed wheat budget. Um, the, the yield differential between feed and or group four and group one and two varieties has basically meant that if farmers growing a one or a two had to go for quality, had to get a premium to just justify the lower yield. If we use reflection here as a group as an example, the leading group four um, variety, compare it to Crusoe, the traditional um, sort of state group one, you can see that differential. So it was by no means economical to grow that. It had to get going for a premium market to justify the yield differential. Let's bring in Skyfall to start with, and you can start to see that that gap is eroded. Let's bring in Trinity, a similar level of, of yield, and then you bring in Lily. So you're very, very quickly eroding um, uh, that uncompetitiveness. And essentially what that means is that there is a likelihood that these varieties will be used as dual purpose varieties. So I'm gonna grow this variety um, as a low risk variety. I'll grow it however I want to grow it. Um, if it has to end up in the feed heap, it'll end up in the feed heap. If I get quality, if I get premium, that's the added bonus. I think this is a really fascinating period of time we're going through in the wheat market, um, and it, it will make the wheat crop more mobile and more marketable to take advantage of when there's a global maize issue and feed prices are high, or when there's a milling wheat issue and we need to mobilize quality. I think it's a really important element, and I'm um, really encouraged to see that it's happening. Give us, essentially, it's giving the whole market a lot more flexibility, the ability um, to adapt. I'm going to move on from wheat now and to talk about barley and really get into the, the, um, the global barley, sorry, the UK barley um, supply and demand element. And looking at barley supply and demand, you'd be forgiven for thinking that we are in the late 1990s with the scale of crops that we're producing. Three crops now in the, in the realms of 7 million tonnes, something we've not seen since the intervention era, but this is doing on purely commercial terms. And I think it's a, 
yes, it's driven by the weather, but I think looking at the planting information, you can start to see the commercial competitiveness of barley in the UK rotation and the competitiveness of, uh, of UK barley in a European and a, and a global context as well. So some strong availability of, bit of a big crop and carryover stocks um, as well. Let's look at demand. Again, similar to wheat, despite that high availability, demand is slightly lower year on year, likely a little less multi capacity available um, to, to utilise um, there. The balancing items, again, very similar to wheat. Just look at how big that black segment is on that chart, that stock available for, to, to find its way into exports or into stocks. It's very, very similar, similar picture to what we see for wheat. You should expect that the st ending stocks at the end of this season will grow year on year, just as wheat, because it's still a function of that carry going through. I don't, unless we see some wild change in the carry, um, then we have to budget for growth in, in barley and, and wheat stocks. Exports would be really important, and barley exports, I think, are a bit of a success story um, for the UK, and certainly at an absolute but a proportional level, actually doing better than what we're seeing for, for wheat at the moment. July, August exports around 265,000 tonnes and all but 1,300 tonnes going into the EU. So it's dealing with the currency issue as well. And I think that's, that's pretty remarkable stuff. There's a huge challenge, just as there is for wheat. I don't think we will avoid a stock build-up, um, um, but certainly um, barley appears to be in much better shape than the wheat situation. Just to touch on oats, um, before we get to the end of the presentation, we don't have new season oats supply and demand data. That comes out with DEFRA's um, first official supply and demand estimates in November, but certainly the oat market is in the UK is reeling from strong availability we saw in 2013 and 2014. Um, and it's going to be an interesting crop to watch. The European crop is slightly lower, by around half a million tonnes, according to the IGC this year. Um, and I think it remains a niche, but it remains an important niche. And I think the context of oats as a break crop with the demise of oilseed rape economics will be one to closely watch, but it's one that's going to require quite a good amount of supply chain cohesion to encourage production to come online. Um, so I'm very conscious, Chairman, that I'm running over time. So there are my UK conclusions. And really just to wrap up with three final um, overriding conclusions, I think it's fair to say we are, from a seller's point of view, on the ugly side of um, the commodity cycle. How long it lasts, I don't know, um, essentially. Um, give me a weather forecast for the main producing regions of the world and I'll let you know. Um, it's as fairly straightforward as that, as I will allude to every single year. Um, there are risks out there. There are underlying feed grain risks out there um, that need to be um, kept in mind going forward. And I suppose my sort of blunt message here is that if the last 10 years haven't convinced you that price risk management is a key part of any business involved with grain, you will never be convinced of it. And I wish you the best of luck in operating in this environment. Um, moving on from that, I touched on the carry quite a lot through the presentation and talked about that as the, almost a commercial solution to intervention. It's the market doing what essentially intervention did um, under a sort of managed market regime. The other element the cap used to manage market was compulsory set aside. I think every single farm business needs to think about what its low price strategy is and is removal of marginal hectares out of production part of that low price strategy to um, preserve cost of production, preserve the life of machinery. I would urge farm businesses, businesses to consider what their low price strategy is. We are part of the price cycle. We should not be surprised when we go through periods of low prices below cost of, um, cost of production, largely because it links into the final statement there. We are part of a very liberalised and a very free market competitiveness um, at a commercial level, at a supply chain level, is the only thing that's going to deliver long-term and sustainable resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you.